Okay, here's the challenge. Feed two billion more people, but with less land and fewer emissions. Net zero. Net zero. Net zero. So we've all heard the term, but what does it mean when it comes to our food? Are we going to eat different things? And what will our land look like? It turns out the way we feed the world is bad for the planet. It produces 35% of all of our greenhouse gas emissions. And by 2050, there'll be an estimated 2 billion more mouths to feed. Right, so how on earth do we get to net zero? This is Morgan Gillespie. She's director of the Food and Land Use Coalition at the World Resources Institute. So meeting her feels like a good place to start. There's problems of distribution, access. And there's problems with marketing and consumption. Are we making the kinds of food that we should be consuming that's good for our human health and for our planetary health? But across all of those things, there's a lot of food that's being produced today that's wasted. If we continue business as usual, it's likely that we're gonna need 400 million more hectares of land to feed our growing population. That's an area twice the size of Mexico. Right. So we have a pretty inefficient system then. We do produce enough food to feed everybody, but we don't distribute it evenly and we waste far too much of it. But it turns out it could also be more efficient in the way that it's produced to begin with. Because agriculture uses about 70% of all fresh water, which is becoming a more and more precious resource. So we're going to have to learn to make more with less. Luckily, there are some pretty exciting innovations already. Like vertical farming, Crops don't have to be grown above ground or even in soil. And by carefully controlling the conditions, vertical farms can produce more food with less water and less space. Technical innovation is one of many tools that we need to help the transformation of the food and land use systems. OK, surely you knew this was coming. It's time to talk about meat. 90% of deforestation globally is driven from agriculture. It's primarily beef. And meat doesn't just take up land. A 2021 study found that nearly 60% of all emissions from food come from meat. That's everything from methane burped by cows to the emissions generated to produce our animals' food. So what does that mean for the food on our plates? We don't want everyone to shift to a plant-based diet. What we should be considering is a reduction of beef consumption, particularly in the global north, by as much as two thirds. And that sounds really scary to a lot of people. But by doing that, that enables folks who are currently suffering from malnutrition or undernutrition due to poverty to increase their meat consumption so that they reach healthy and sustainable levels of, of protein. But it's not just what we eat that we need to be mindful of. Soy is the second big driver of deforestation. Timber, to a lesser degree, and then palm oil. And palm oil is like the silent killer. It's in shampoo, it's in lipstick, it's in chocolate bars. Right, so then how do we stop deforestation? Everyone in the system has a role to play. Governments have a role to play in setting and implementing strong policy. Companies can think more critically about the types of food they're producing. They can think about sharing their profits more equitably across their supply chain. And then we as people have some agency as well. We can choose, for example, to reduce our meat consumption. And the fact that you will start purchasing less meat will send a demand signal to the companies to know that they can stop selling so much meat, which reduces pressure on the environment. The second voice you have is with your vote, and that's an equally impactful driver of action. So how should we be using our land? Rewilding is the large-scale restoration of ecosystems to the point where nature can take care of itself. Many of the world leaders have uh, pledged uh, that 30% uh, of our land and seas uh, will be dedicated to nature's recovery by 2030. If we were to rewild 30% of Britain with a combination or a mixture of peatlands and heathlands and woodlands and species-rich grasslands, for instance, it could have a significant impact uh, on pulling carbon out of the atmosphere. OK, so could we just plant lots of trees to offset all of our CO2? Well, different people have different figures, but according to an Oxfam report, 1.6 billion hectares of land would be needed. That's five times the size of India or all the farmland on the planet. We don't want rewilding to be used as an excuse to carry on emitting carbon at the same level. We have to massively reduce our carbon emissions. So what's the balance then, right, between rewilding and still producing enough food for everyone to eat? In England alone, we have 350,000 hectares of golf courses. So there is a lot that you could rewild with minimal impact on the ability to produce food. 
So there are still some big decisions to be made. And with food, more than anything else in net zero, we have a particular emotional connection to it. It's linked to our histories, to our cultures, which makes changing our attitudes to it particularly hard to navigate. But people's habits are changing. And it's easier to imagine change now more than ever. What we want to aim for by 2050 is a world in which all people have access to healthy and nutritious food. We have the tools to do this. We know technically how to do it. We know politically how to do it. We can figure out the financing to make this happen, but we need all the players in the system to do this together. The idealized future is possible.